good morning. Welcome to Owensboro Christian Church. My name is Kurt Jordan, and I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church, and I am thrilled that today feels like fall. Yeah, clap for it. Let's go. No, it's awesome. Uh, it, it is time. It's hoodie season. It's, it is flannel season. It's cardigan season. Not yet, but it is like in the morning, and then when you sweat through it, you take it off, and you might be like me, where you have a pile of jackets that lives in your office, because you show up, and you're like, it's freezing outside, and then by two o'clock, it's 96 degrees again, and that is the beauty of fall. I'm all about fall. I love fall. Take me out, sit me by a fire, love it. Pumpkin spice lattes, call your boy. I want them, all right? I love them. I am... Fall to the max, I'll wear a flannel every day, I don't care, okay? And one of my favorite parts about fall is that to me, it represents hope. Because hope, one, that I can stop sweating all the time. Hope number two, that I can cover up my ever so pale legs with pants more often. And hope number three is for football season. Right? It's football season, college game day, the crisp morning air, woo. And I'm a Mississippi State fan, so I start every year with hope. And <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it's hope. That's what hope's all about, right? It's believing that maybe it'll happen this time. Uh, it hasn't yet, but I'm gonna keep believing. But the reason I even bring up hope is because that's what we're gonna be talking about today as we jump into Luke chapter 24. We're gonna read this whole passage, which is 13 through 35. I'm not gonna ask you to stand for the whole thing. Instead, about halfway through at some of the key moments, I'm gonna invite you to stand as we read. So starting in verse 13, Luke 24 starts out and says, now that same day, Two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. It's important to understand that this same day is the day that Jesus resurrected. This is three days after he was crucified in Jerusalem. And these two guys are leaving the place where Jesus was crucified. And we find out earlier this chapter that the tomb is empty. He reveals himself but these guys didn't yet know that Jesus was alive. So they're leaving Jerusalem. Together, on this seven-mile journey, they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. And the one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened in these days? Listen to what Jesus says. What's happening? He asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a powerful prophet in action and speech before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we were all hoping. We had hoped that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but, but they didn't see him. And he said to them, this is Jesus, how foolish are you? And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. I'm gonna invite you to stand right here as we finish this passage out, out of respect for the word of God. In verse 28, it continues, they came near the village where they were going and he gave the impression that he was going farther. 
But they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening. And now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he then disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the word of the Lord, amen? Amen, you may be seated. I love traveling. Truth be told, I don't even love getting to the destination that we're going. Like the destination for me is not what traveling is all about. Traveling for me, the part that I love is the road trip. Oh, the night before a road trip, I'm 25 years old, I still get giddy. (laughs) We could be going to Evansville to get new tires or something. And I'm still, my wife's like, you need to go to sleep. I'm like, I can't, I'm too excited. (laughs) And I get excited because there's podcasts we can listen to. We're gonna bond in the car. We're gonna hang out, especially when it's all your friends. And then there's the road trip snacks. And I'm not talking about the guy who shows up and he's like, my mom made beef jerky, but we don't want that, okay? Don't open it in the car, it smells bad. I'm talking about, this is, personal experience I'm speaking from, I am talking about gas station snacks, the bountiful harvest of like a five-star or a shell station. Oh, there's so much. You go in, and a road trip, this is a tip for all you people that, have, that are going on road trips, maybe you've got trips planned, that's the perfect time to try something new, right? You go in, you look, oh, there's that watermelon mango soda that you never even thought about. I'm gonna get that. And the rest of the car, sometimes they wanna stick to Dr. Pepper or Pepsi or whatever, boring, not for me. I'm all about trying something new on a road trip. And I I love it. Road trips are amazing. I love the trip there. And sometimes I love the trip back even more because now we've got even more to talk about and we've bonded over this time that we spent together. The only time I don't love traveling is when things don't go as planned. You see, a few years ago, I was working in college and 20s ministry, and my job during the summer was to lead a group of 10 interns, and they were recently graduated seniors, or they had just gotten into college, and they would come, and they would be a part of a summer leadership program that our college ministry put on every year. And so my job was to lead them, and we bonded over the whole summer. We, we woke up every morning at five. Believe it or not, I woke up at five and went and worked out, and it was awesome, and it was so fun, and by the end of it, the big cap off to the end of the summer is that we all as a team would go to high school camp together. All 10 of us would go and whenever we got to high school camp, we would act as the rec team and some of the cabin leaders and some of those awesome things. And so we went on this trip and high school camp went off without a hitch. It was awesome. It was so fun. I say without a hitch. I got irresponsibly violently sunburned. Um, I have never been that sunburned in my life. And I am not um, tan (laughs) by any stretch of the imagination. I talked about my shorts earlier. There's a good thing I don't wear shorts on stage or else you would have to avert your eyes from the blinding white light that would reflect off of my very pale legs, okay? I got violently sunburned, so much so that like I I was taking Benadryl just to sleep through it. But I made it through and... For the most part, it was great. If you've never attended a student camp or a high school camp, I do wanna tell you, one, you definitely should. It's an amazing experience. It's life-changing, not only for the students, but for you. You even get something out of it. It's amazing. You can ask any MSM, HSM leaders that have ever been on the camps. But they will also tell you that the beds aren't up to code (laughs) at a lot of church camps, huh? Like, Bed is such a relative term, and these beds are usually like pieces of plywood with like a mattress pad that's like this thick on it, that really, it might as well not be there. 
Um, and so that's the church camp. And you sleep well enough because you're tired, but by the end of the week, you're pretty much out of gas. And that's how all 10 of us were. And so the last night after camp, we unload everything and like basically would have to take and tear down the stage. We're already tired, but we're still excited. And we're on fire for Jesus. We just had an incredible week of camp. And so we load up our giant moving truck with all of our equipment. We have to do it until like 4 a.m., but it's okay because we got the long road trip the next day. And so we go, go back to sleep, wake up for our eight-hour drive home, walk out. The guy driving the truck turns the keys over and it goes, that's my impression of a truck not working <laughs> because the truck wasn't working. And we were like, all right, well, we'll just call the company. And so they brought the new truck, which some of you were like, that's great. We had to wait four hours for it, which was not great. They brought the new truck. But the issue is they didn't bring like a crew of people to get the stuff off the old truck. There was only one group of people that's going to get the stuff off the old truck that we spent hours loading up the night before. We then proceed to unload all of it and then load it back onto the new truck. Now, by this point in the trip, I am furious, but we finally get on the road, and I calm down, and I'm feeling a little bit better. Things are going better. We're rolling. We get about four hours into our trip. We're in Hoover, Alabama, and my memory's hazy on this part of the story. A lot of people claim that it was me that said this. Everyone except for me that claims that I was the one who said this, but I don't remember. I don't have a great memory, so I'm going to, you know, hypothetically, I may have said well, at least things can't get worse, which if you've ever been in a situation where things can definitely get worse, that is not what you want to say because somehow it activates some, I don't know what it is because 10 minutes following that sentence, whoever said it, whoever it was, following that sentence, we get a phone call and we hear behind us, doom, 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 doom. That's my impression of a truck breaking down <laughs> because a truck had broken down and it had blown out not just one, but three of the available tires. And so we pulled into a shell station in Hoover, Alabama, where we sat for four more hours while another truck was delivered. You guessed it. We unloaded everything off the truck and reloaded it one more time and finally headed home. We got back to the church parking lot the Sunday morning at 2 a.m. and none of us were happy anymore. The on fire, the, the way we were supposed to feel, it, it was gone. And I got off and I'll never forget the one time in my life that I could have punched my boss in the nose was when he said, hey, um, we gotta unload the truck because we gotta take it in the morning. So at 2 a.m., we unloaded that God-forsaken truck one more time. <laughs> and I went home angry. But I was supposed to leave camp feeling on fire for Jesus. I was supposed to be hyped up and energized. But instead, I was frustrated and disappointed. And really, that's the part of the camp that I remember most vividly. You see, things didn't go how we planned them. None of us enjoy when things don't go as we planned. None of us enjoy when we have a plan, a way that we want things to go, and then it ends up going the exact opposite, or it goes badly. Because we've all experienced moments like I had on that trip unloading trucks and being frustrated. But maybe it's bigger than a truck. Maybe it's something in your marriage that's disappointed. It didn't go as you planned. Or you're struggling with your finances. People get sick. People lose jobs. Life doesn't always go as we planned it. And if we're not careful... When we find ourselves facing disappointment over and over and over again, and plans being broken over and over and over again, we can find ourselves living lives through the lens of hopelessness. 
And today, as we dive into Luke chapter 24, we're gonna see when we're in that place, the place where it feels like giving up is really the only answer, the place where it genuinely feels like it could not get worse, where it feels like all hope is lost, in that place, Jesus meets us there. And so we pick up in Luke 24 with these guys going down the road. They're heading out from Jerusalem. And this is important because what had just happened in Jerusalem, as we already talked about, Jesus had been crucified on that Friday. And this was the Sunday. They're walking home three days after he had been crucified. And these two guys are followers of Jesus. We're given one of their names as Cleopas, the other one we don't know their name. And as they're walking the seven miles back to Emmaus, they're having a conversation about all the things that have happened. And I don't know exactly what that conversation sounded like, but it says they're arguing and debating and they're discouraged. I mean, can you imagine where these guys are on the road? As they're walking, thinking about the fact that the Messiah, the one that they believed was going to save them, had just died in front of their eyes. The disappointment, the hurt. And while they're talking, scripture tells us that Jesus appears and joins them on their walk. But in Luke 24, 16, it says that they're kept from recognizing him. And so Jesus joins them in the middle of this conversation that they're having about how discouraged and how frustrated they are and how hopeless it feels. And Jesus shows up and doesn't allow them to recognize him. And there's a lot of theories and conversations as to why Jesus does this. Why does Jesus not reveal himself immediately? And, and there's a lot of different theories, but I believe it's because Jesus wanted to have an honest conversation with these guys. If you've ever seen the show Undercover Boss, it's kind of like that. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Undercover Boss, but the premise is the boss of a company goes undercover, it's very well titled, uh, goes undercover and like he'll go to like Del Taco and the man general manager, the CEO of Del Taco will go work in the Del Taco. I don't know why I chose Del Taco and not Taco Bell. He'll go work in the kitchen with everyday workers. They put on prosthetics and things like that. And the thing about the show is that you find out really quickly that when the boss is around, people act way different. And you probably have experienced this in your workplace, in your lives, different places. Like when the boss is around, or if you're the boss when you're around, I don't wanna tell you this, but your workers are not acting the same way when you're not in the room. And this is proven by Undercover Boss because you watch it and all of a sudden they act one way around the boss. They're like, we never mess up at work. We always do everything right, just how they're supposed to be done. And then the moment this dude shows up and he's like, hey, I'm a new trainee. They're like, all right, the boss wants us to do it this way, but I'll show you the real way that we do it. And like, they act crazy. They act wild. And there's some sweet moments in that show where the boss like finds out like, oh, it's a lot harder than I thought it was. But the point I'm trying to make is that Jesus doesn't reveal himself to these guys because he doesn't want them to sit there and go, oh, Jesus, we never doubted you. We never, he wants to have an honest conversation with them. He wants to meet them where they are honestly. So Jesus asked these guys what they're talking about. And these guys respond in the way that anyone would during that time. They're like, bro, you've got to be the only one who doesn't know what's happening right now. And Jesus asks, what's happening? And these guys proceed to tell Jesus about Jesus. They say Jesus of Nazareth was this great teacher in word and in action. He healed people. He taught us to love one another well. But the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they didn't like what was going on. So they arrested him and crucified him on Friday. That's where these guys are. For three years, they had followed Jesus. They had believed him. He was the one who was gonna save him. Now he's dead. 
Luke 24, 21, these guys tell Jesus, we had hoped, we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. This word hoped is a key indicator of how these guys are feeling. Their hope is lost. Proverbs 13, 12 says that hope delayed makes the heart grow sick. These guys are leaving Jerusalem with a sick heart. They believed everything that Jesus had told them when they followed him. They thought he was going to overthrow everything and redeem Israel. They thought he was going to be the new King David right then and there. But the religious leaders, they killed him. He was supposed to save us, to redeem us, and now he's dead. Things did not go as we planned it. What these guys are essentially telling Jesus is that things didn't go how they wanted them to go. Jesus hadn't acted or been what they wanted him to be because the followers of Jesus at that time, they wanted a lion, but Jesus came as a lamb. They wanted a mighty general, but Jesus came as a servant. They wanted a politician, but Jesus came as a prophet. They wanted a crown, but instead Jesus took a cross. They wanted revenge and justice, but instead Jesus came and brought grace. God doesn't always give you what you want, but he will always give you what you need. Which begs the question, what is it that we need from God? You see, because many of us are like these two followers of Jesus. Whether we'd admit it or not, we want Jesus to move in our lives. Absolutely, amen. But we want it to happen in a very specific way that we have planned. Jesus, here's my life plan. God, I trust you to do things my way. Here's my schedule, and I'm gonna trust you, so I'm gonna fit you into my schedule. This is how I want things done. This is how it's supposed to happen. This is how I would do it, and this is the best way that makes me feel the most comfortable. So God, do that. This is what I want. Trusting God means being uncomfortable. Trusting God isn't saying, God, I'm gonna fit you into my life plan. Trusting the Lord is saying, you will make my life plan. Because he knows what we need. And the beautiful thing about following Jesus is when we trust him for what we need, it often turns out to be exactly what we should have wanted in the first place. To example this, I'm gonna show some authenticity here. I wanna eat Oreos for every meal. Double stuff. Amen. And if there's somebody here that's like, single stuff's better, we'll talk about it later. We'll pray for you. But I don't eat a whole pack of Oreos, even though I want to, because I don't want an Oreo ball of concrete sitting in my stomach all day, making me miserable. And also, because I need to eat something with nutritional value. Oreos are essentially just like quick Crete made into, they're delicious. They don't offer real nutritional value like something healthy would. They're empty calories. And every time that I've ever sat down and ate something and and denied that want of mine to take what I need, ate something healthy and chose that, every single time I feel so much better and I think this is what I should have wanted all along. In the same way, God doesn't always give us what we want the way we want it, but he's always going to give us exactly what we need. So Jesus is talking to these guys on the road, and they've just poured out their hearts to him, right? They've just 
taken a moment and said, uh, stranger, I, I don't really know who you are, but, but here's what's going on. And here's where we're at. We're hopeless. We're disappointed. We're frustrated. We're, we're, we're broken down. We've had to unload the truck 40 times. It, it, nothing's gone as planned. And Jesus, how does he respond to him? He says, you fools. It's <laughs> actually what he says. Jesus responds to him and says, how foolish are you? And only Jesus can do that in the right way, by the way. Like only he can listen to the hopelessness and then respond with you fools and it'd be okay. Imagine if you were at a funeral and I was there and I came up to you and I was like, what's going on? And they're like, yeah, we're just so sad. We, we lost our friend or loved one. And I'd be like, you fool. Don't you know you'll see them again? How foolish of you. Like that would be not great etiquette. And only Jesus can do it in the right way. And he does because Jesus calls these guys foolish for a reason. He rebukes them for a reason. He's asking them, how could you be so slow to believe all of the scriptures? All of the prophecies about the Messiah said this was what had to happen. Were you not listening? This was the plan. It's not what you want. It's what was needed. But Jesus doesn't just rebuke them and then peace out. He doesn't just call them fools and say, how dare you, and then leave. No, because that's not how Jesus operates. Jesus then proceeds to, for the next seven miles, walk them through the scriptures pertaining to himself to help them understand and he does it lovingly, and he cares for them. And here's an incredible example for us. This is just a side note. Whenever we are called to correct or rebuke someone, we should do it lovingly and tenderly and walk with them through it. Relationally, hear what they have to say, and then correct as needed. So Jesus walks with these guys, and he starts from the beginning and walks through everything that had happened. And we don't know exactly what, what it went like. But we do know that Jesus met them in a place of hopelessness and pointed them to the scriptures. This was Jesus' first move. He pointed them to the word of God because the best medicine for a sick heart is God's word. And so he walks them through it, starting in the law and the prophets and walks all the way through. And we don't know exactly what it sounded like or how he put it to them. I heard another preacher say that if we had the transcript of this particular sermon, if this, this particular message that Jesus walked them through, then people like me would be out of a job because every week we would just show up and be like, all right, we're in Luke 24 again and we're just gonna read what Jesus said uh, right here because it's perfect. Because in this moment, whatever he's saying to them, their faith is exploding. And something amazing is happening. And so after these seven miles, they arrive at the village and they're all tired. And it looks like Jesus is going to head on. And they still don't know it's Jesus, but they invite him in. They say, Jesus, come stay with us. And so he comes in with them and, and they sit down to have a meal. And Jesus breaks the bread and in the moment that he breaks the bread and hands them peace, they recognize who he is. It was Jesus the whole time. And the work that had begun in them on the road as they went through the scriptures from a place of hopelessness to walking through the scriptures, that work was solidified when they realized it was Jesus the whole time. Their hope was restored. And the moment that they recognize Jesus, he disappears. I remember my first date with my wife was five years ago this month, actually. And I took her, we went to go see a band, I took her to a nice dinner, and then I did the most romantic thing ever. So, single guys in here, this is for you. This is a tip. 
thank me later. Took her to the most romantic place I could think of to hang out after dinner, um, Waffle House. <laughs> and we sat there and drank coffee and watched the roaches scurry around. It was awesome. <laughs> Gave them names. It was, it was adorable. That genuinely happened. I took her to Waffle House. We sat there for four hours and just talked. And whenever I left and dropped her off, I was madly in love with her. And I was ready to tell her, I was like, I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna ask her to marry me. I stopped myself, because I, I did actually love her, and I didn't want her to be like, um, no. <laughs> so I waited a couple more months. But I remember getting home that night, and my roommates were in the living room, and when I walked in the door to my house, I, uh, I opened it, and I was gonna go in the room, tell my roommates what happened, but first, I did, if you've ever seen like a romantic comedy or like a TV show where someone has like a really good date, I don't know why, but like instinctually, I just like leaned against the door and went like, (sighs) you know, (laughs) I don't know why I did it, but it was, it felt magical. (laughs) And I walked in the living room and I'm trying to play it cool at this point, and I was like, sup, and then my friends were like, sup, and they were like, how did it go? And I was like, you know, amazing. <laughs> and, they, and they're like, cool, cool, cool. And then four 20-year-old men proceeded to squeal like schoolgirls, high five one another. We we're like, yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Because I guess they thought I was never gonna get married. I don't know what they thought was gonna happen. <laughs> but I was like, it's awesome. And the reason I responded this way was because the experience of hanging out and meeting with my future wife filled my heart with love. And it filled me with hope. These guys, after Jesus leaves, they don't get frustrated and say, Jesus, you died on Friday. Why are you leaving again right now? They don't take a moment and talk about how cool it was that Jesus was just hanging out with them. Instead, they look at one another and react this way. They say, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining scripture to us? When we truly meet with Jesus in an honest way, there is a visceral reaction within our very souls. Because when we meet with Jesus, our hope is restored. When we meet with Jesus, our hope is restored. These guys on the road to Emmaus were reminded of their hope by the risen Savior. And maybe you need to be reminded of your hope today. I don't know what road you're on. I don't know what disappointments and broken plans you've been facing, what trucks you've had to unload, what people have hurt you. But just like these men were reminded that their Savior is not dead, I want to remind you as well, your Savior is not dead. He's alive. Amen. And that means that he's available to you. He's available. He's closer than you could ever imagine. You can meet with him in prayer. Scott said a few sermons ago that honest prayer honors God. When we pray honestly and meet him in our most honest of places on the road to Emmaus where everything seems broken, when we meet with him there, and we pray and we we talk with them. It honors him, but it also begins a process of healing in us. Prayer is an amazing tool, and another way that we can meet with Jesus is through the scriptures. Just like these two men on the road to Emmaus, where did they go when they were in a place of hopelessness? Jesus brought them to the scripture, to the word of God. So the question is, do we believe that the word of God is a priority in our lives? Or 
do we not really believe that? And we don't think it's really all that important. And I'm, I'm sure many of us in here would say, oh yeah, absolutely, amen. 100%, it's so important. The word of God is very important, but with our actions, we don't show that. It is vital that you have a personal time with Jesus reading his scriptures. Outside of any congregation, outside of just between you and him, it's vital. And it's also vital for us to come together with other believers. That's why we do what we do here on Sunday mornings and Saturday nights, to come together for our hearts to burn and our hope to be restored. Just like these guys on Emmaus, on the way to Emmaus, who had maybe the greatest Bible study ever. They were filled with hope. And the best part about hope being restored is that when we meet with Jesus and we have that hope restored to us, we then have an opportunity to share it. These guys, instead of just sitting in their house talking about how cool it was, they responded, they reacted, and then they moved. Jesus met them on the road, but they didn't stay there after. They took action steps to share that hope. They went and they found the 11 and the others. They went back to Jerusalem right then and there. They had just walked all the, all the way from Jerusalem. They turned around and went back to go tell them, to share with them that Jesus was alive. The hope of the gospel is contagious. The truth that our story doesn't end with a grave because the grave that was meant for us was taken by Jesus the truth that he didn't stay in that grave, but he rose triumphantly and defeated death and hell to secure our place in eternal life. That truth is contagious. That hope is contagious. And when we live our lives with that hope, it's noticeable. When we've experienced that hope, we're called to tell others to show others through the way we live and also through conversation, to fellowship with other believers who together have our hope restored and our hearts burning together, but to also share that hope with those who have never experienced it so that their hearts can burn too. I'm gonna end today with a simple invitation to respond. You see, these guys, they, they responded. They didn't stay on the road once they met with Jesus. And so for us today, the response call is this. Today, you feel like you're on that road. Come meet with Jesus and have your hope restored. Maybe for you that looks like coming down to this altar and taking a physical posture of humility. Making a bold physical step to show the inward work that God is doing. If that is where you are today, then I invite you and this altar is open. If you need to pray for anything else, this altar is open. But today if you're on the road, meet with Jesus. Or maybe for you it's meeting with Jesus through scripture. Maybe it's today, maybe it's making a discipline of meeting with Jesus through scripture so we can continually renew that hope. Or maybe you're already walking in that hope and you believe I'm walking in the restored hope and let me say I commend you and encourage you to go and share that hope with others. Bring someone alongside you. Don't keep that hope to yourself. Pour into someone else. Love someone else, talk with someone else, care for someone else the way Jesus has called us to. Or maybe you have never experienced that hope at all. And today you wanna, for the first time ever, experience what real, true hope looks like in Jesus. To follow in believer's baptism. I wanna invite you that today's the day. We would love to talk with you, to have a conversation whether during the song or after service. Regardless, I'm asking and the Lord is calling us to respond. So would you pray with me? Father, we love you. 
God, we believe that you are good. Lord, even in the midst of disappointment, even when things don't go the way that we want, your goodness gives us exactly what we need. Lord, sometimes what we need is loving, correction, and rebuke. Lord, sometimes what we need is a loving reminder of the hope that you offer us. Lord, I pray today in this place you would move. Lord, that we would respond to the move of your spirit, that we would respond to who you are. Lord, if you're calling us to move to the altar, Lord, I pray we move. If you're calling us to have a conversation with someone, I pray we move. Lord, regardless of what we're called to do, Lord, I pray you would make our hearts burn for you. Restore our hope. Fill us with joy. Fill us with who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen.